Our keynote speaker for today, who, if you cared, is the same age as my father. <laughs> he is slated to be the first man on Mars. He's an accomplished Paralympian in both skiing and track, becoming the most decorated monoskier in US history. That's hardly his whole story. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Waddell. Yeah, hey, hold on. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, all of you. Very cool. Big day. This is interesting. I do a fair amount of speaking, but this stuff makes me nervous. <laughs> it really does. I thought about this and thought, I'm supposed to have some pearl of wisdom, you know, this nugget of wisdom that makes, it brings a little bit of anxiety. And today I went out and, and I was walking around town, pushing around town, and I might have been the crazy guy that you saw because I was actually doing my speech as I was going around town. <laughs> And I ended up down at Snow King, and I was like, oh, well, this looks like a nice little road. And I went up the hill and, and went through the cemetery there. And it gets really steep. I don't know if you guys know that, but it gets really <laughs> steep. I got to one point where I was like, you are totally committed here because you're not going to be able to go backwards. Like, you've got to keep going. <laughs> and, and it was a beautiful day. And we had lost my mother a few years ago. And, and it was just sort of this moment that I had in that she would have loved this. I mean, she just would have loved what's going on here. My friend Andrea was, was so instrumental in bringing me here and the connection that we had from school and from ski racing and watching students who, are, who have done so much and then are ready to go on and leave, to go on to the next thing. And, and for me, it was great to be able to share that celebration with her and then be able to share it with you. And as I prepared for this, I thought, well, what would my 18-year-old self want to do. So I put myself in the shoes of my 18-year-old graduating self, and my 18-year-old self said, why the hell would you want to do a graduation speech? <laughs> like, that is idiotic. It's crazy. Why would you want to get up in front of people? My 18-year-old self was panic-stricken talking in front of a group. I've actually grown to love it, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but my 18-year-old self kept going and saying, you actually make your living like speaking to people like that. I thought this thing was stupid. That is really stupid. You acted in a, in a, uh, in a soap opera. Like really? It's not just speaking in front of people. It's like being vulnerable in front of people and doing something else. And why would you do that? You wrote an, and illustrated a children's book. Shouldn't you do something a little bit more grown up? You climbed Mount Kilimanjaro? Like, why would you? My 18-year-old self had gone to summer camp in upstate New York. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but upstate New York is the land of nightly thunderstorms. So anytime we went on a camping trip, it meant being wet, cold, dirty, and miserable. And it's like 19,340 feet. Why would you want to do 19,340 feet of miserable? Like, that is completely stupid. My 18-year-old self was okay with the skiing thing. Like, that was okay. That's not too bad. So if I have a message for you, the message is that your life is going to take a lot of twists and turns. You might have a great plan, and it might not work out the way that you planned. And that's okay. We were talking last night, and you said, you said the Jimi Hendrix thing, and, and, and I'm going to go with this, so we'll see what happens. I'm actually quoting a more obscure folk singer. Harry Chapin said, said, no straight lines make up my life, and all my roads have bends. There's no clear-cut beginning, and so far, no dead ends. The no dead ends part is so important to me that so often we think something's happened and we've come to a dead end and we're done. And he said, no, there are no dead ends. The Dalai Lama said, sometimes not getting what you want can be the greatest gift of all. We know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. And sometimes what we don't know 
can be this amazing opportunity that can catapult us to who we are. Picasso said that when I was a child, it took me four years to learn to paint like Raphael. But when I became an adult, it took me a lifetime to learn to paint like a child. That child, to me, is the genius. It's about learning the rules well so that we can break them properly. So that we can show who we are, what we have to contribute, and possibly make this world a whole lot better place. This is the gift for you. Mark Twain, when he was 14 years old, or Mark Twain said, when when I was 14, my father was so ignorant, it was painful to be around him. But by the time I turned 21, I was amazed at how much the old man had learned in seven years. I don't think I was ever more convinced of what I knew than when I was 18 years old. And the gift is that you actually get to keep learning. So much of our lives, I think there's a diametrically opposed part of our lives. The one, we want to be successful, right? We want to be successful, we're willing to work hard, we're willing to sacrifice, we're willing to do whatever it takes to be successful. And we think that that success is something that we can grab and that we can hold, that it's static. And the hard part is for all of us, something will happen that cuts us to the bone. Whether it's death, divorce, uh, addiction, bankruptcy, moving, whatever it is, that forces us to question who we think we are, who we believe we are. And the other side is that we don't really, and this might not be completely appropriate for you right now, but we don't want to get old, right? But if we don't want to get old, we, want to, we have to continue to learn and grow and dream. And that can be painful. We look back and say, that was such a great time. But in the moment, we think, wow, this is really hard. Those two things are important. If we can take the emotion out of the success part if we don't get there and looking at ourselves as a failure and going, I failed, I'm a failure, and go, no, 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 this is actually just a necessary step in that journey, in our ultimate success. I do a lot of speaking with schools. Our name tags program is about getting beyond the labels that we put on ourselves and others. And I often, at the end, get the question of, if you could go back in time, if you could avoid the accident, would you? And you know what? I'd love to go from being 4'10 to being six feet again. You know, I mean, sometimes the view doesn't change here, and sometimes it's not all that great. But, <laughs> but I have consistently and emphatically said that I would not want to go back. I wouldn't want to trade the experiences that I've had and the person that I've become for being able to walk again. Our lives will take a lot of twists and turns. Sometimes you don't know what the gift is. I told you that I would get back to the speaking part. And so I actually, I was a ski racer in college. And my first day of Christmas vacation, I skied at a place called Berkshire East in Massachusetts. My brother and I went up and Berkshire East is commonly referred to by the locals and, and lovingly referred to as Berkshire ice. It's brutal. It's icy. But this day, it was warm. It was sunny. There was only one strip of man-made snow that snaked down the mountain. And we were skiing. And it was the beginning of the year. And I was searching for that feeling. It's so much of, of bringing everything together, right? It's that search for the perfect turn. And it's, it's the strength. It's the technique. It's the tactic. It's everything. It's the equipment. And I was searching for it. And I went over a little knoll. And I made a turn. And my ski popped off in the middle of a turn. And I fell in the middle of the trail. Didn't hit anything but the ground. And I broke two vertebrae. Damaged the spinal cord. So my life changed significantly in that moment. And I was in the hospital for two months. And then I went back to college. I went back to Middlebury College, an almost 200-year-old school built mostly out of granite on the top of a hill in northern Vermont in the middle of February in a wheelchair after losing 50 pounds in the hospital. And I think back and I think that was crazy. But it was also it was the greatest thing that I could have done because my life with my friends didn't change. 
for me, I recognized that I was still the same person that I had been before. That was great, but I also felt like I was wasting time. Because the only way that you recover is, in my situation, is by walking again, right? And so after school ended, I went to a secondary rehabilitation place called Shake a Leg in Newport, Rhode Island. It was a holistic healing center. So it was a little bit hippie, you know, it was a, a lot of body work, ma massage, Rolfing, Feldenkrais, uh, movement. One of the guys who created it was a choreographer. And so we'd get like high power, power wheelchair quads out of their chair and there was like dance stuff that would go on and things like that. And I went into this place saying, okay, I'm rolling in, but I'm walking out. And there was some traditional therapy. I went to the weight room the first day and the guy who's like 5'10", 2'10", you know, biceps stretching the, uh, stretching the, the polo shirt. And he said, what, what's your, what are your goals for the year? And I said, I don't care what you do to me. I just want to get better. And he said, excuse me? I said, I don't care what you do to me. I just want to get better. And he's like, do you have any idea what I can do to you? <laughs> and I found out. And there were times I was on the bench press, and I said, how many more? And he said, two more. And I did two more. I said, oh, that's too easy. Two more, two more. And he's finally, he just has like the two fingers just, just sort of helping, just lift, just keeping it moving. I have tears like streaming down my face. And he said, well, you told me I could do whatever I wanted to. And, but that to me, I was searching for a miracle. Like that one keyhole that could open up whatever might be possible. Every day was like Christmas in some ways. Because every day might be that opportunity to break through that threshold, to find that miracle. And as we went along, my straight leg braces arrived. And so these are braces that will just lock out and lock out my legs and so I can stand up and I can walk. And, and so this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. And at the same time that they arrived, an off-off-Broadway company called Manhattan Class Company arrived. And they said, well, we're going to put on a play. And these are some big guys now, like Bernie Telsey is the, is, is the, the casting agent to like the Oscars and Bobby Lapone was the original lead on Chorus Line. And they said, we want you to, we want you to audition. And I said, no. I don't do that. That 18-year-old self is like, what do you want to do? You want to put me in front of all these people? I don't want to do any of this at all. And they said, well, come on. And so much of my life that year was about saying yes. About saying yes, because that little keyhole, that was about saying yes, saying yes to opportunity. I recognized that it was also the foundation of improv. Yes and you're building the stories, which in so many ways is a great metaphor for our lives, right? It's not like, no, it's yes, and what's the next thing? And so I auditioned, and I read, and I thought, okay, well, that's kind of cool. I gave them what I, what, I, you know, what I can do, and I left, and then they called me back and said, well, can we get you to read this? And I ended up as the lead in this play, which in some ways was like a sixth grade you know, sixth grade play. But at the same time, I was still the lead in this and we had some of these professional people who joined us as well. And it was this massive effort to get ready. And so we would do improv. And what I recognized, this is the speaking thing, was so often when I was younger, whatever I had in my head, when I started speaking to the group, it fell out of my head. I had no idea what I was supposed to say. And this improv thing was suddenly like, I don't know what I'm going to say, but I have to keep the story going. And suddenly it was the most empowering thing that I could possibly do. And so we did all of this stuff. We did all of the rehearsals, and then we're ready to go. And the performance was like competing. The goal in competing is to let go. Is to, is to do all that preparation and let go and perform like that child, right? Picasso, to, to be like Picasso, to paint like the child, to let go. And this is the letting go that we had in the play. And I was completely hooked. 
I was like, okay, I can let go. It's that same kind of performance. And then I can also connect with the audience. We saw, we saw Maverick recently. And this is exactly what Tom Cruise was talking about, right? There's, there, there's, oh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally mess up the, the line now. There's, uh, there, there's, there's no, oh, there, there's no think. There's just do. Which in a lot of ways, we might be approaching the Yoda part of Tom Cruise's career. <laughs> right? There is no try. There is only do. Right? This is Tom Cruise. We've, we're approaching. The, and so I had to, at the very end, the day before we were supposed to put on the play, we actually had a competition. I had about half of the lines in the, in the play. And so they put me on one side and everybody else on the other side. And we did this competition to see who could be the most convincing. And we're going back and forth. And then it's ultimately tied. And it was, a, it was an amateur play. So they hadn't written the final. They're always hecklers. It's amazing. But... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, the, uh, it was, and they hadn't finished the, the play. So Bobby looked at me and he said, finish the play. And this is sort of that improv thing of like, okay, I'm here. I'm in. I'm invested. Okay, I will do it. And I did it, and I ended up winning. And then he said, okay, good. That's the, that's the end of the play. And I was like, well, but what did I say? I don't remember what I said. And he's like, well, just do whatever you did. You're in charge. This is it. This, and so this is, there's a little bit more nervousness as we approach. And not only did I have to do that, I actually had to stand up. And I was not very good. This is sort of like this spider standing kind of thing where my legs are straight out in front of me. I have these forearm crutches. And I'm supposed to basically do a dip, but the dip bar is moving the whole time. And lift myself to crutch it, to standing and then deliver this monologue. And I delivered the monologue, and the monologue basically was something along the lines of, I've learned it, you've learned it, we, we just need to do it. And so I think I ripped off Nike more than I ripped off Shakespeare <laughs> in making this happen. But to me, it was that moment of recognizing that I thought being healthy, being whole, recovery, was about walking. And it wasn't, it was about being healthy and happy and having dreams and having the ability to go and chase those dreams and realize those dreams. The Dalai Lama at one point, they asked him what, it, what concerned him about humanity and he said, man. He said, man concerns me that he sacrifices his health to make money. And then he sacrifices his money to try to recuperate his health. And then he's so concerned about his future that he doesn't enjoy the present. The result is that he doesn't live in the present or the future, but lives as if he'll never die, and then dies having never lived. And if there's any recommendation, I'd say, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't live that way. Your lives are going to take a lot of twists and turns. Enjoy the root. Don't look at something as a failure. Don't look at yourself as a failure. Look at yourself as this was an important step in getting to the next position. Getting on in my journey. Realizing myself as a human being People ask me oftentimes when I, when I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, and they said, how did you prepare to climb Mount Kilimanjaro? And I tell them, and it sounds like a little bit of an offhand answer, but I tell them everything that ever went wrong in my life. That's how I prepare. You don't know what's going to happen, but things have gone wrong in your life, and you've found a way to move forward. You've found a way to get better. You've found a way to improve upon it. We're all climbing our mountain. And if we can use those minor failures to get to the top of the mountain, then we really are a success. So good luck in your journey up the mountain. Thank you for letting me share this day with you. Congratulations.